All right, so today we're going to be looking at um, abnormal uterine bleeding. So before we get to the abnormal, uh, let's just kind of talk about what is normal uterine bleeding for a female. Um, the normal is primarily been characterized uh, with a few uh, criteria. So the first thing is um, the frequency. So the frequency is generally 28 days, uh, but this can be plus or minus 7 days. So that means anywhere from 21 to 35 days. Um, the frequency, and then the second thing is going to be the uh, duration. So let's just write frequency here. That's one way to describe it. Then we have duration of once bleeding begins, how long is it bleeding for? Uh, this is anywhere from 5 to 7 days. This is normal. And then finally is the amount. So on average, a woman will probably lose anywhere from 60, sorry, from, um, let me erase that, from 20 to 60 milliliters of uh, blood. And this is obviously kind of hard to uh, measure. Uh, a lot of times they measure with how many pads they use uh, or comparisons to previous uh, menses, but it's, it's tough, to do, uh, tough to measure. So, um, you know, just, by carefully asking questions and using uh, different forms of measurements, you can uh, figure that out. So if that's normal, let's talk about what's abnormal. So when we talk about abnormal, uh, there's a few different things that we might be uh, looking at. We might be talking about uh, menorrhagia. Me menorrhagia means um, excessive amount of blood flow or just high blood flow. And this could either be a high duration. So for example, it's going to be lasting greater than seven days. So they might be having you know, the menstruation for, you know, a week and a half to two weeks, or just a, a high amount of blood uh, quantity. So they'll have anywhere from greater to 80, 80 milliliters. So either if it's lasting very long or they're just a heavy flow, uh, both of these will be characterized as menorrhagia. Then we have metrorrhagia. In metrorrhagia, we're not really talking about the flow per se. We're talking more about the frequency so in metrorrhagia, um, it's there's more frequent, and but the amount of blood will be um, normal or maybe even less than normal. And finally, uh, there's meno metrorrhagia, and this is a combination of the two. So in this case, you have a high blood flow, either duration or amount, plus you have it's very frequent. So even in between cycles, they're already bleeding. So this is the general definitions. Um, how do we, uh, you know, main categories of this uh, are generally uh, based on the age. So we have uh, premenarchal, which means before they have the onset of menses, and this is generally you know, considered uh, less than, you know, 12 years of age. Um, then we have, so we have this, and then we have postmenopausal. So these are kind of, you know, alarm symptoms. Uh, and then obviously you have bleeding uh, during the reproductive age. We'll tackle that last. There's a lot of causes for that. We'll kind of take these, uh, these two first because they're going to be uh, a little bit more straightforward. So uh, let's talk, let's start with premenarchal. Uh, what can cause this? Um, so let's look at causes first. Um, the variety of causes. Uh, the first thing, the, the most common cause is foreign body. Uh, so maybe they'll, you know, kids, you know, do funny things. They might uh, put something uh, physically uh, up their vagina and then that will cause uh, bleeding to come from that or infection. Uh, and the other thing that you also want to rule out is sexual abuse. Uh, sexual abuse can sometimes present as, um, you know, bleeding from the vaginal area. So that's also something you need to keep in mind. Uh, secondly, they could be taking some sort of endogenous estrogen uh, and this leads to something called precautious puberty. Um, so it could be, you know, they might be taking the mother's OCP pills, uh, if, you know, if, there's, if it's the combined type, or it, it might be something, you know, they might be having some type of tumor or cancer which is secreting estrogen and that's the third cause. So any type of cancer such as uh, vaginal cancer or cervical cancer, uh, can lead to that. And of course, cervical cancer, you want to do um, 
pap smear. And then the, uh, there's a specific cancer in this age group, which is called uh, sarcoma botoroides. And this is actually really easy to diagnose because as soon as you do a pelvic exam, you'll see this grape-like structure uh, coming out of it. So that's fairly easy and straightforward to diagnose. And then not only um, tumors in the genital area, but you can also have uh, adrenal tumors and pituitary tumors. And so in these tumors, they might be secreting estrogen, and this is leading to uh, precocious puberty, which will lead to uh, menarche at a very young age. So uh, how would you want to work up a patient um, with this? Of course, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to one, so you're going to want to do a pelvic exam, uh, and you're looking for the foreign bodies. Uh, you're looking for you know uh, any signs of sexual abuse, uh, any cancers or, or growths or tumors that might be coming out. And actually, you also want to make sure which site is it coming from, because sometimes it might be coming from the urethra or it might be coming from the rectum. So you want to kind of rule out those two causes specifically. If that looks normal, um, then you probably want to do some imaging either uh, CT or MRI because you know with with the physical inspection you can pretty much rule out foreign body you can rule out sexual abuse you know all those things but you can't rule out uh, you can even rule out sorry vaginal cancer cervical cancer but you can't rule out some of these tumors maybe an adrenal tumor so you're gonna want to um, do MRI of the pituitary gland uh, you're gonna want to do an MRI of the uh, abdomen and you also want to maybe do an MRI of the pelvis. So that kind of is an overview of the uh, premenarchal causes. Uh, the second one we're going to look at is going to be the uh, postmenopausal causes. Postmenopausal, um, the causes are, can be grouped, grouped into primarily three uh, categories. There's benign causes, uh, malignant causes, and what I like to call exogenous causes. So, um, what are your benign causes? Uh, benign causes is going to be atrophy, uh, because in this age group, in the postmenopausal age group, uh, you know, estrogen goes real low, and so there's nothing for the endometrium to stay stimulated, and so you might get endometrial atrophy, uh, and on top of that, you can get vaginal and cervical atrophy. And so, when this these uh, atrophy the skin becomes very friable, very weak, very thin and narrow, and so that can lead to uh, bleeding as well. So fairly benign. You would treat it primarily by maybe giving, you know, estrogen if they have hysterectomy. You can give those. Um, you, know, you can give estrogen if they have hysterectomy already. Now uh, there are some malignant causes. Uh, one of them is going to be ovarian carcinoma. Uh, ovarian carcinoma can release estrogen and so this can kind of lead to unopposed estrogen and lead to uh, uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding which we'll talk about in a little bit and you can also have you know tumors of the vulva of the vagina and the cervix so all those uh, tumors as well exogenous a lot of times women are taking hormone replacement therapy to you know help them with the hot flashes or help them uh, maybe they have osteoporosis anything like that you might be taking it and this can lead to bleeding and um, they can also be taking anticoagulants. So if they have a heart condition, they might be taking warfarin, and then that might lead to uh, increased bleeding. Now, for evaluation, um, you know, there are certain uh, cancers um, which are much more prevalent in this age group. So the first thing you want to do is you want to assume it's cancer. And you want to treat it like a cancer case and, you know, until it's ruled out. So uh, your, your, uh, you will primarily start with a physical examination. Uh, you might even want to start with a general examination, make sure that, because they are losing blood, you know, make sure that their vitals are fine, that they're not uh, in any type of hypotension or tachycardia. Uh, that's important. But after that, you can do a more specific exam you know, of the vagina. Uh, here's where you can notice atrophy. Um, you know, the, you'll notice the walls, there won't be any fortices. And also you want to pinpoint the location because sometimes urethral and rectal uh, bleeding can be confused for vaginal bleeding. So you want to first just kind of confirm it's coming from the vagina. And again, just by looking, you can rule out many things such as 
atrophy of the vagina and other things as well. Secondly, you primarily want to focus on the endometrium and you want to go ahead and try to rule out cancer. And so you can do that in two ways. You can do a transvaginal ultrasound, but the gold standard is definitely biopsy. So you want to try to get a biopsy of the endometrium. And finally, your next attention will be focused on to the uh, cervix. So you're going to want to do cytology uh, of the cervix uh, to rule out cervical cancer. Uh, treatment will depend on what the underlying cause is. Obviously, if it's one of the cancer, you're going to treat those according to the principles underlying uh, cancer treatment uh, for those specific uh, tumors. And if it's atrophy, uh, you're primarily going to be looking at uh, giving maybe HRT. And of course, if it's HRT, you want to stop giving that. And after coagulants, maybe you want to decrease the dosage uh, of whatever they're taking or give them something else. Okay, so the final one is going to be uh, abnormal uterine bleeding in the reproductive age. So, of course, bleeding during this time is very, you know, it's normal, and, but, you know, abnormal bleeding, you do need to figure out what's going on. So, um, let's first talk about the different causes. There's many, so you kind of, I'm going to give you a big list here, but just try to uh, bear with it. Uh, the first thing you want to definitely rule out is pregnancy, because they can get pregnant during this time, and so, of course, you're going to give them beta ACG. And so this can either be an ectopic pregnancy, they might be having an early abortion, or it might be a molar pregnancy. So uh, these are three things you definitely want to think about first. Uh, the second thing is they could be having some abnormal growth. Uh, this can be uh, leomyoma. Uh, leomyomas can uh, you know, uh, cause this, and just uh, if it was a leomyoma, how would you treat it? You treat it with a uh, uh, uterine artery embolization. Embolization. Uh, so that's how you do that. Uh, besides that, you all, you could also be an endometrial polyp or endocervical polyp. So you can just have a polyp being formed and uh, causing bleeding there. Um, next, we can look at external causes. So they might be doing something, uh, you know, it's outside the body that's causing this. M one of the reasons could be an IUD, either the copper or the morena, which we talked about in the other video. And the other can also be uh, OCPs. So either the COCP, the combined one, or the progesterone-only pills. Um, it can also be, uh, if they're on hormone replacement therapy for any reason, and even tamoxifen is known for doing that as well. Uh, more causes, right? Uh, you can have an infection. So an infection can cause it. So uh, endometritis, which is you know kind of a postpartum thing a lot of times, and this is the... Uh, caused by the gonorrhea and trochomatis as well. Uh, those all can cause that. Even bacterial vaginosis uh, can lead to this type of uh, bleeding. Uh, mycoplasma as well, which is uh, another common cause of uh, vaginal and uh, gynecological infection. Um, and PID, of course. So infections uh, higher up can be there as well. Um, next, there are some systemic causes. What are some of the systemic causes? A liver failure, so I'm thinking, you know, they have decreased coagulation factors can definitely cause that, and even uh, renal failure. Renal failure can cause it as well, and thyroid. Thyroid problems can uh, also be there. Uh, coagulopathy, uh, so any of the coagulopathies, you know, hemophilia, von Willebrand's disease uh, can cause this as well and um, thrombocytopenia as well, of course. So anything that has to do with the blood's ab ability to clot and coagulate can definitely cause it. Now, say you cannot, you, you, it's not a pregnant, there's no growth, you know, they're not taking anything, they don't have an infection, no systemic causes, then it gets labeled as DUB, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. This is pretty much means idiopathic, they don't really know what's going on. This is broken down into two groups, uh, um, anovulatory and ovulatory. So anovulatory is, ovulation is not going on, so you basically you just have unopposed action of estrogen. Because in order for um, the regular menstruation to occur, you have to have ovulation which 
creates the corpus luteum, which creates the progesterone, and then progesterone withdrawal will lead to menstruation. If you don't have that, estrogen keeps building up, the endometrial wall gets thick and thick and thick, and finally it falls, uh, you know, sloughs off, and so that can be a very common cause of uh, diffuse urine bleeding. The other one is going to be ovulatory. They don't really know what, why it occurs, but what the current idea is, uh, you have increased prostaglandin, uh, which is going to uh, decrease the vascular tone, or in other words, it's going to cause vasodilation. And so when bleeding happens, it's a lot of bleeding, just because all these vessels in that area are dilated, and so you get uh, much heavier bleeding than usual. And why do you think prostaglandins are involved? Because uh, this tends to get better with NSAIDs. So that's going to be the causes. Uh, what's also important that we look at is going to be uh, workup. So if you get a patient, what are you going to look at first? You know, which way are you going to go? So like we discussed earlier, the first thing that we want to rule out is pregnancy. So get your beta HCG right away just to make sure she's not pregnant. Um, and that's not only important for uh, figuring out the cause, but if they're pregnant, you know, there's many things you can't do. And you also want to check the CBC uh, to make sure they're not too anemic because they are bleeding. Uh, so that's something you just want to take a look at real quick. Um, what else would you want to do? You can do a pap smear uh, just to rule out any HPV or, or cancer of the cervix. Uh, you can do something called a wet prep. And so what happens in a wet prep is uh, you get some of the cervical secretions and you put it in a... Um, saline solution and then you take a look at it and so that's your pretty much web prep in very simplistic terms uh, finally you want to take a look at the endometrium so there's many things you can do uh, again you can do uh, hysteroscopy which is a current way to go about doing it you can do it uh, dilation and curatage which is a little bit more invasive and then you can get a, the pipel device uh, which kind of go you know you kind of Pull the device in there and just kind of scrape a little off. Um, but the I think the uh, one of choice is hysteroscopy because there you can look at it with your eyes, look around, see it, what's how everything is uh, going on. Um, you want to do an uh, ultrasound as well. How does an ultrasound help you? Uh, firstly, it's going to be able to identify any polyps uh, that might be in the area or fibroids that need to be. So you need to rule that out anyways. So ultrasound can definitely help with that. But uh, it can also help you with uh, looking at the endometrial size. Uh, so the endometrial size is normally, so the normal is 8 to 11 millimeters. Now, if someone has hyperplasia, which will occur in the non uh, an, uh, anovulatory DUB, um, it's, it's going to be greater than 8. It's going to be, sorry, sorry. Normally, it's 5 to 8 millimeters. But in hyperplasia, it's going to be 8 to 11 millimeters. And if there's a cancer, it'll be even greater than 11 millimeters. So that's, uh, so you know, just by doing an ultrasound and taking a look at the endometrial thickness, it's uh, going to tell you a lot of information. So uh, how do you want to treat it? Of course, depending on the underlying cause, that will uh, gear the treatment. But just remember NSAIDs can really help because uh, they block that prostaglandin effect. Uh, contraception is a very common way, especially if it's uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Uh, it can help in that. Uh, you might also want to get an, uh, give antifibrinolytics um, just to make sure, you know, to, just to kind of decrease the bleeding. Uh, the most common one is going to be trexamic acid. And this is used in uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding as well. And you might want to give some iron supplements. Uh, just to uh, make sure she doesn't become anemic. And finally, there are some surgical options. Uh, if you can use uh, dilation and cure talk, and maybe if they don't want to have any more babies, uh, hysterectomy. So uh, that is pretty much the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you very much.